This is Don McNally. He recently passed away at the old age of 96, and in his long 96 years of life, he completed a grand total of 744 marathons, a feat that is all the more impressive when you learn that he only ran his first marathon at the not-so-young age of 48. Don clearly wasn't a natural athlete. In fact, he only started running in his middle age after having been spooked by the premature death of a close friend of his. But while it may have been fear that prompted Don to run his first ever marathon, it was his love for running long distances that kept him committed. So much so that at the age of 85, McNally would add a further 29 marathons to his total. The British Medical Journal published a series of articles that tracked McNally's physical and mental health from the age of 68 to 91. In the end, their conclusion was a really simple one. According to the lead author Odessa Addison, McNally was a wonderful example of how older adults can stay fit and appear to have more energy and enthusiasm than most people have his age. Runner's World actually contacted Don just 18 months before his death. He told a magazine then, I've lived longer than any of my relatives and I haven't noticed any mental slippage. I'm very happy and content. I feel very fortunate. I think it's safe to say that the worst thing about living longer and getting older is the physical and mental decline that all too often comes with old age. In fact, most people believe that this decline is inevitable, that it's just a natural part of the aging process, one that we must all come to terms with. But Don McNally's story contradicts this narrative. Don ran his first marathon at the age of 48, and ran his 744th, his last, at the age of 89. Most people, half his age, can't even finish one. And just months before his death, at the ripe old age of 96, he boasted that he was just as sharp as he had always been, making the mental decline associated with old age seem less inevitable and more preventable. My name is Hashem, and I'm a University of Cambridge graduate and medical doctor. Here on YouTube, I make quirky videos about the human brain that explain how the brain works, why it sometimes doesn't, and the different things that you can do to make it work better for you. Today, I'll explain why marathon runners have the best brains, and hopefully, I'll do a good enough job to convince at least a few of you to give it a try. One area of the human brain that you will hear a lot about over and over again is the hippocampus. The hippocampus plays an essential role in learning and determines our ability to store old and acquire new memories. It's also typically one of the first areas of the brain to be affected by Alzheimer's disease and also happens to be where the dente gyrus is located. The dente gyrus is a fascinating part of the brain because it's the only part of our brains that continues to divide and produce new nerve cells throughout our adult lives and even well into our old age. We call this neurogenesis. Besides being a tiny bit of good news for those of you who like me, may have destroyed a few too many brain cells earlier on in life and continue to do so occasionally. The dented gyrus happens to be one of the areas of the brain that are most affected, in a good way, by endurance running. That's because running long distances on a regular basis has been shown to stimulate the dented gyrus so that it produces more brain cells. This matters because typically the older we get, the less active the dented gyrus becomes. In other words, it's still producing nerve cells but at a much slower rate, and endurance running appears to be able to offset this age-related decline, which may partly explain why Don McNally felt just as sharp at 96 as he was at 36. But the number of nerve cells is only a small part of the overall picture because running long distances not only produces more nerve cells, but also gives rise to cells that look remarkably different from those produced by non-runners. When you run a lot, the nerve cells produced at the dented gyrus will be more complex, meaning that they'll have more dendrites and higher spine density, and therefore more synapses or connections with each other. Therefore, marathon runners have brains with nerve cells that are more interconnected and more easily able to retrieve bits and pieces of information like distant memories. This explains why runners often score up to twice as high as non-runners in various memory recall tests like pattern recognition tests. 
I just want to take a moment to say that way too many people fail to appreciate that the number of nerve cells we have actually means very little in the grand scheme of things. What actually matters way way more are the connections or the synapses that exist between these nerve cells and allow them to communicate with each other. It's these connections that make the human brain, well, a brain. <laughs> For example, the internet would still be the internet, whether there were only two computers connected to it or the staggering 10 billion devices that are connected to it today. Your brain is very much like the internet, and the connections between your nerve cells matter far more than the actual number of nerve cells. In fact, several recent studies have illustrated that individuals with higher IQ typically have higher dendritic density and hence more synapses or connections between their nerve cells. In other words, it's the synaptic density that determines intelligence rather than the overall number of neurons. I won't say more than that because this will actually be the subject of next week's video. <laughs> if you don't want to miss it, subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified when it's published next week. Long distance runners have been found to have a larger hippocampus overall, which might explain why they tend to perform better in tests involving spatial navigation, spatial memory, and speed perception. However, the hippocampus is hardly the only part of the brain that gets significantly larger in endurance runners. I know this because I actually run marathons. I think these are all my medals. Occasionally. <laughs> And so I can tell you with some degree of confidence that endurance running is actually incredibly demanding on the human brain. This deceptively simple and repetitive task involves the brain processing millions upon millions of different pieces of information, which it then uses to generate thousands of predictions. It's these predictions, for example, that tell you when and how high you should jump should an obstacle come your way. It's also these predictions that inform you of what the most efficient way of running is so that you're able to adjust your gait accordingly. No two runs are the same, and the best endurance runners will be the ones who not only have excellent cardiovascular fitness, but also superior cognitive and motor control that they can use for planning, muscle inhibition, working memory, attentional switching, and cognitive flexibility. Perhaps it should not come as a surprise then that endurance runners have a significantly thicker left paracentral gyrus, an area known as the motor cortex that is responsible for planning and initiating muscle movement. Moreover, the posterior lobe of the cerebellum, known as the neocerebellum, is also enlarged in marathon runners. This part of the cerebellum plays a vital role in fine motor skills and coordination. So, endurance running may in fact help make you a better pianist, or may even prevent you from falling over and fracturing your hip in old age. That's made possible by the corpus callosum, which is also more well developed in endurance runners. The corpus callosum is a thick bundle of nerve fibers connecting the brain's left hand side with the right hand side and vice versa. In fact, it's the most important and prominent connection between the two brain hemispheres. It allows you to register a sensory input and quickly relay that message over to the other side of the brain, so your muscles can react enabling you to run more effectively or maybe helping you avoid a fall later on in life. A question you may be asking now is how does marathon running do all of this and why is it unique from other forms of exercise? And well, the truth is we actually don't know. But we do have a theory <laughs> which does an excellent job of explaining why marathon runners have superior brains to other similar athletes. It seems the answer lies in the dreaded lactate or lactic acid produced by muscles when they undergo anaerobic respiration. You probably know lactate as the reason why you get cramped when you overwork your muscles. It's also why you feel sore after a strenuous workout at the gym. While high levels of lactate are damaging, low and steady lactate levels such as those produced by endurance running allow the lactate to leak into the brain through the blood-brain barrier. It's in the brain that lactate, in steady moderation, can increase the expression of everyone's favorite neurotrophic factor, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF then stimulates the release of endorphins in the brain that are responsible for the runner's high that many people experience while they're out running. It's also BDNF that promotes the production of new and complex nerve cells in the dente gyrus in the adult brain, helping offset the mental decline associated with old age. In fact, BDNF is most likely why Don McNally fell in love with running after his first marathon in 1968. 
It might also very well be what kept him mentally sharp throughout his life until his 96th birthday. Could BDNF and marathon running do the same for you? Maybe. As always, you should find all the references I used to make this video along with a poster summarizing the information in this video, available to download using a link in the description below. See you all next week.